thanks very much, Naomi. Um, I'm just going to be standing up here briefly because unusually for these lectures, you're getting a double act today. And the reason is that uh, before he became a Hansard reporter, Stephen here worked for the History of Parliament Trust. Um, so he knows a lot more about the history of parliamentary reporting than I do. Um, so I think we're very fortunate to, uh, to have him here and we can benefit from his particular knowledge and expertise. So I'll hand over to him now to take us back in time. Okay. Thank you very much, Lorraine. And welcome to you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, well, I do have a text to read out, uh, and that goes into the history of Hansard in more detail. But by, before I begin that text, I thought I would, uh, it would be useful to start by checking whether you all understand what Hansard means, because people often get confused uh, between uh, the th three things that are called Hansard. Um, and they are uh, the confusion between Hansard and Hansard, between Hansard and Gurney, and between Hansard and other Hansards, including the Hansard Society. So I don't want to lose you all at the beginning, so let me try to explain what I mean. What do I mean by the confusion between Hansard and Hansard? The best way to remember it is that there was one family, but two different branches, each with its own printing business, and each producing different publications for or about Parliament. One branch, headed by Luke Hansard, were the official printers to the House of Commons, and they published all the official documents, including the journal, select committee reports, and so on. The other branch, headed by Thomas Curzon Hansard, uh, who set up a separate printing business from that of his father, Luke, published the parliamentary debates, or what we would now call Hansard. So here was one family, but two different companies. A second confusion is between Hansard and Gurney. The Gurneys were another parliamentary dynasty, this time of shorthand writers, uh, going back to the 18th century and the development of Gurney shorthand. Their role was recognised in Parliament by the appointment of William Brodie Gurney as official shorthand writer to the Commons in 1813. And the shorthand writers produced transcripts of formal oral evidence presented to Parliament, almost always uh, the evidence of witnesses in front of select committees. But they were not the same as the <coughs> parliamentary reporters, who wrote transcripts of what was said in debates in the chamber and elsewhere, although some of those reporters, of course, also used shorthand themselves. And indeed, in passing, I should also mention the political reporters, who worked in the press gallery, providing not transcripts of debates, but parliamentary summaries and increasingly parliamentary sketches. That was a development of the 19th century, the late 19th century, uh, as was the rise of the lobby correspondents, who again were political journalists who happened to be based at Westminster, but they weren't working on general um, debates, they were working on parliamentary news. A third confusion is between Hansard and other Hansards, and there are, of course, two Hansards just in this Parliament, because the House of Lords has its own separate Hansard, with its, own, with its own reporting staff. There are also official reports for the devolved assemblies, and many Commonwealth countries, notably Australia and Canada, have similar publications that are also known as Hansard. Then again, there's the Hansard Society, which is a research institute or think tank that now has no connection with Hansard as such, but it takes its name from our official report because when the Hansard Society was founded in 1943, Hansard, the publication, was seen as a vital means of educating the public about the importance of parliamentary democracy and representative government. So that perhaps brings us back nicely to this lecture, uh, because as we've heard, one of the aims of this lecture series is to increase uh, public awareness of the processes and relevance of the institution of parliament. Having said all that, then, let me turn to the text of my talk. And it's a great pleasure to be able to talk about what Hansard is and what Hansard reporters do. Our job is normally to listen and to write because we translate the spoken word, what members of parliament say in the House of Commons, into the written word of the official report that people can read in print and online. 
In fact, we spend so much of our time listening that we are acutely aware of how difficult it is to speak well in public, especially speaking off the cuff, um, which is why I've chosen to write out what I wanted to say today. Of course, in doing so, writing out my text, I've left in all the superf superfluous words, the verbal hints and oral cues that help to make it a text which is easy, I hope, to listen to as a spoken presentation. Whereas if you had to read this text, you might find it just a bit too wordy. So perhaps the first thing to say, and this is something that a lot of people find difficult to understand, is that Hansard does not record all the words said in the exact order they're spoken in Parliament. Hansard is not a verbatim or an absolutely verbatim word-for-word -word transcript. It is what we call an edited verbatim transcript, if that's not too much of a contradiction in terms. It means that Hansard records nearly everything that is said, but without the ums and the ahs, the false starts, the slips of the tongue and the little faults of grammar that can make a fully verbatim transcript so, tra so frustrating to read. We aim to provide a full, accurate and fluent report, and we do so by removing repetition and a good deal of the wordiness of everyday speech patterns. We take out a lot of the verbal scaffolding, if you like, to make the transcription read more easily on the page. Above all, Hansard is the official legal record of what has been said, and not of what has been decided, but of what has been said in Parliament. And it is also a vital historical record. As the Liberal politician Lord Samuel said in 1949, Hansard is history's ear already listening. Now, in other words, we carefully record all the facts, the arguments, and the examples. And of course, it goes without saying that we do so in an entirely impartial and neutral way. But we do not have to put in every single word that is said. As the editor of the parliamentary debates, Thomas Curzon, Hansen, Thomas Curzon Hansard Jr. said, in evidence to the Common Select Committee inquiry in 1862, and I quote, I hold myself bound for the bona fides of the reports, not for their literal accuracy. And I'm sure that Lorraine would say that she holds herself bound in exactly the same way. Now, Hansard reporters do a great deal more than just type up what is said from the audio recording. We have to check facts and dates, confirm the names of individuals and organisations, and verify quotations. We have to reflect the procedures that are being followed and to record the exact decisions made in line with the official journal. We have to make sure that we correctly identify the member speaking. That's not always as easy as it sounds when members look nearly the same or have nearly the same names. And we have to ensure that they refer to each other in the correct way. Above all, we have to prepare a clear, faithful transcription that may have been slightly tidied up but nevertheless retains the nuances of the argument, preserves the flavour of the member's style of speaking, and with very few stage directions at our disposal, captures something of the drama of the occasion. And we have to do that for everything that is said, not only in the main chamber, but in the parallel chamber of Westminster Hall, and in all the Commons committees as well. In many ways, the role of the parliamentary reporters hardly changed over time. A hundred years ago, one of my predecessors, Michael McDonough, who wrote a good book on the history of the reporters' gallery, uh, commented thus. He said that the reporters' chief task is so to unwind the verbose skine as to make clear the hidden governing principle, the salient points of the speaker, to present the vague thought with definiteness, and to give the language in which it is expressed consecutiveness and coherency. And again, nearly a century before that, in 1824, an anonymous visitor to the press gallery had some sympathy for the parliamentary reporters, given that, as he said, their eyes and fingers must ache at the writing of speeches, that their memories must be on the rack recollecting, and their judgments untwisting and piecing together the bones and muscles of this body of eloquence. And in fact, that is still a pretty good description of the demanding physical and mental processes that we go through. So let me turn a bit to the history of parliamentary reporting. And it has a long history. 
It's usually said to date from the 17th century, particularly during the Civil War, when an outburst of news books or pamphlets provided digests of parliamentary news. The early 18th century witnessed the beginning of more regular reports in monthly political magazines, the first being Abel Boyer's Political State of Great Britain. Various attempts were made by the House of Commons to, over time to assert its ancient privileges against the reporting of Parliament, but publishers usually evaded these restrictions, for instance by holding back publication until the recess, or by using a thinly disguised format, such as purporting to reproduce the debates of the Senate of Lilliput. One prominent early reporter was Dr Samuel Johnson, who may never have actually attended Parliament. And it's important to understand that his type of parliamentary reporting was really a form of literary composition. He sometimes received little or no indication of what had happened in the chamber, and he certainly used his own words in his reports for the Gentleman's Magazine in the early, 18, uh, the early 1740s. And there is a celebrated anecdote of how at a literary party when the assembled company were praising an example of the Elder, Spe uh, Elder Pitt's oratory, Johnson rather sheepishly admitted, that speech I wrote in a garret in Exeter Street. In his defence, Johnson gave up parliamentary reporting when he realised that people were taking his accounts of, as verbatim reports of proceedings. A standoff in 1771 between the House of Commons and the newspaper publishers of parliamentary debates, who were powerfully backed by the City of London, led to Parliament turning a blind eye to the publication of its debates thereafter. That episode did not mean that Parliament had given up its zealously guarded right to keep its proceedings secret, but it did mean that Parliament recognised the futility of trying to restrict the publication of its debates when there was so much public interest in them. The de facto lifting of reporting restrictions coincided with and was perhaps related to a massive expansion in the number of newspapers and of newspaper readers. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, extensive and sustained reports of proceedings in Parliament therefore started to be published continuously in the rival London newspapers, including the Times, which came to have the fullest coverage of parliamentary debates, certainly by the late 19th century. An outstanding innovator at the beginning of the 19th century was James Perry, who increased the Morning Chronicle's parliamentary output by being the first editor to use a team of reporters rather than just one reporter for each house. And it's also at the turn of the 19th century that what became uh, known as Hansard first emerged. The men who were parliamentary reporters 200 years ago, and they were all men at that point, were therefore newspaper employees. And one of the differences between then and now was that in the old Palace of Westminster, before the fire in 1834, reporters had to compete for places with the public. By convention, they sat on the back row of the public gallery facing the Speaker's chair, which the Scot William Jordan recorded was not only the best for hearing, but had no neighbours behind them uh, to help the motion of their pencils with their knees and elbows. So unlike us, reporters had no automatic right of admission in the early 19th century. And although in 1803 Speaker Abbott ordered the Sergeant-at-Arms to allow reporters in to use the back row of the gallery, uh, the reporters often still had to fight for their seats on popular occasions. The main difference between then and now, however, is that parliamentary reporters in the past did not have audio recording equipment to work with, or even, until the middle of the 19th century, sound amplification to help them hear what members were saying. So how did they do their job? Uh, one pioneer was the Irishman Sir James Caldwell, who published the proceedings of the Irish House of Commons in Dublin in 1766. He attended and wrote his accounts, he said, entirely from memory, after each sitting, rather like memory waterfall did in London. Caldwell boasted that I quote, the deliberate recollection which writing made necessary brought back the ideas in a slow but regular succession and generally in the very words that had been used to express them. Well, it now seems somewhat ridiculous to think that reporters relied wholly or even partially on memory and it is unlikely that any reporters, even the celebrated William Woodfall, had perfect recall. But we live in an age that has almost entirely lost the practice of relying on such oral 
memory. So I do not entirely rule out uh, part of Caldwell's claim. At the other extreme from simply using memory was the development of shorthand for reporting. One late 18th century amateur practitioner was Sir Henry Cavendish MP, who filled dozens of notebooks of shorthand reporting, many of which he later transcribed himself, although only a few have ever been published. But according to the reminiscences of another Scottish reporter, John Campbell, later Lord Chancellor Campbell, newspaper reporters relied on memory or notes rather than shorthand. Referring to the early 19th century, Campbell later wrote that I knew nothing and did not desire to know anything of shorthand. Instead, he advised that a reporter, and they were apparently permitted to take notes from about 1783, a reporter should take down notes in abbreviated longhand as rapidly as he can. He must then retire to his room and, looking at these, recollect the speech as it was delivered and give it with all fidelity, point and spirit, as the speaker would write it out as if preparing it for the press. And interestingly, Campbell also noted that, rather like today, as he said, fidelity is the first and indispensable requisite but this does not demand an exposure of inaccuracies and repetitions. From the early 19th century, however, it became usual for the reporters to have to master shorthand, as the young Charles Dickens did, so that he could work on various newspapers and on his uncle John Barrow's publication called The Mirror of Parliament, which was a rival to Hansard for a time. And Dickens was apparently a very fast and accurate reporter, and he was a genuine practitioner of the art of parliamentary reporting. And uh, a very, uh, there's a wonderful account of him, account of him uh, practicing shorthand uh, in the novel David Copperfield. And to go back to William Woodfall, I, I think he was much closer to the modern conception of a reporter than the myth suggested by the nickname Memory Woodfall. As a young man, Woodfall's reputation rested less on his memory, which was perhaps largely a matter of self-promotion than on the thoroughness with which he compiled, checked and revised his reports. He made sure that he received the ministerial brief and sought to corroborate his drafts of accounts of speeches by approaching those involved. Most importantly, he made sure that his accounts squared with and incorporated reports in other newspapers and he checked facts and quotations in other printed works. Again, as might be expected, members also contributed significantly to the process of reproducing the debates, not least by sending in their speeches beforehand or by providing corrections afterwards, as well as by answering queries from the reporters, as they still do, luckily. Some chose to publish their speeches separately, and these were often reprinted in the compilations that became a publishing feature of the period and out of which Hansard emerged. So where does the name Hansard come in? As I've said, the founder of the parliamentary dynasty was the famous Luke Hansard, who was not the publisher of the parliamentary debates. Uh, he was, for many years, the official printer to the House of Commons, and in practice filled the role of a senior parliamentary administrator, since he was also responsible for editing and archiving all the parliamentary papers. Luke Hansard is not a part of the history of parliamentary reporting as such, but he epitomised what we now think of as the main Hansard hallmarks of accuracy, speed, expertise, reliability, and when required, confidentiality. Luke Hansard died in 1828, after which the family connection with the office of printer to the Commons dissented through his third son, Luke Graves Hansard. But it was Luke's estranged eldest son Thomas Curzon Hansard Senior who gave his name to the publication of parliamentary debates. He was brought up as a printer but left the family business to set up on his own and from 1808 he was responsible for printing Cobbett's parliamentary debates, a publication that had come rapidly to prominence after the radical journalist William Cobbett started to compile it in 1803. When Cobbett got into financial and other difficulties in 1812, Thomas Curzon Hansard bought him out. Had he not done so, what we now call Hansard would surely have become famous as Cobbett. The 23rd volume of the parliamentary debates dropped the name Cobbett from the title, which was thereafter simply the parliamentary debates. Not until 1829 was the title changed to Hansard's parliamentary debates, which is what it remained for most of the 19th century. 
Hansard also took over Cobbett's parliamentary history, which incorporated all, uh, almost all the previous accounts of debates into 36 volumes to cover the period up to 1803. Now, Thomas Curzon Hansard and his son and namesake ran Hansard for nearly 80 years, from 1812 to 1889, and their organisation was very different from the one we know today, in that they were the editors, but for the most, most of that time they had no reporting staff as such. Their work was one of collation, taking the fullest reports from various London and local newspapers, as well as the text of speeches supplied by members and their corrections, and editing, editing them into a uniform, coherent report. So the Hansards, father and son, devoted themselves to providing the fullest and most accurate compilation through their painstaking attention to detail. But they did not themselves have seats in the gallery of the rebuilt commons or regularly employ reporters until the 1870s. Hansard remained a private organisation, but from 1855 it was financially supported by the Treasury, which agreed to place a central contract to buy 100 copies of each volume for government departments, embassies and the like. Another big change was that from the start of the 1878 session, Hansard began to receive a formal government subsidy to enable it to cover four types of business normally omitted from the newspaper reports of debates. And these four were the proceedings on private bills by order, deliberations in the Committee of Supply and in public bill committees, and debates that continued in the chamber after midnight. That meant that Hansard, for the first time, had to employ reporting staff. Parliamentary reporting had gradually become much more ex extensive. Whereas in the 18th century, many speeches would have been omitted or drastically reduced in length. By the late 19th century, a convention had emerged that the speeches of ministers and other recognized leading figures should be given in the first person and as fully as possible, while almost all other speeches, which were usually in the third person, were summarized at not less than a third of their actual length. Members were able to revise their speeches and an asterisk against the name of a speaker indicated that their speech had not simply been corrected but substantially altered. From the 1870s, a series of select committees investigated the accommodation, management and financing of the parliamentary debates. And although little was done in practice, the two central gallery seats above the speaker's chair were allocated to Hansard and a committee room was also provided for the reporters to work in. A nadir was reached in the 1890s when a series of attempts were made to outsource Hansard to various other private concerns, including the short-lived Hansard Publishing Union, uh, with the result that the reporting standards fell to a very low level. But to cut a long and rather sad story short, the situation was redeemed by the report of the 1907 Common Select Committee on Parliamentary Debates. It adopted terms of reference for reports that went back to a recommendation in the rather good 1893 report that speeches of all members should be given in the first person and treated in the same way, with transcriptions not being a phonographic record, and that rather strange term uh, was derived from the name of the stenography machines that were coming into fashion at the time. But it should be a full transcription so that in the standard wording now incorporated into Erskine May, the, parliamentary, the, the Bible of Parliamentary Procedure, the report, and this is a quote, though not strictly verbatim, is substantially the verbatim report with repetitions and redundancies omitted and with obvious mistakes corrected, but which, on the other hand, leaves out nothing that adds to the meaning of a speech or illustrates the argument. And those are the terms of reference to which we still work. The 1907 report also recommended that members should not be able to revise their speeches, except in relation to rulings from the chair and uh, in relation to the correction of very minor factual errors. And it also condemned the, re the arrangements for obtaining reports of debates by contract and proposed that the Commons should set up its own reporting staff. That all led to the establishment of new arrangements so that from the start of the 1909 session, 
Neutral and objective official reports of both houses were produced in separate series by staff employed directly by Parliament. And that, with one or two changes along the way, is still how Hansard is now organised. Uh, so at this point I will ask Lorraine to take over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for taking us so entertainingly through the 18th and 19th centuries to the point at which, in 1909, the publication known as Hansard became the official report. Now, sadly, one of the consequences of that change was that the practitioners of the art faded into the shadows of public service. So there are very few historical records on which I could draw to bring us up to date. So I've had to rely on three things. Some staff group photographs that I have hanging up on the wall in the editor's office, the memory of some of my retired colleagues, and indeed my own memory, since I've been uh, working here for 32 eventful years. Incidentally, although the publication was called the official report from 1909, everyone kept referring to it as Hansard. And in 1943, the word Hansard was added back onto the front cover, where it remains to this day. So I mentioned the photographs in my office. The first one shows the group of 13 fine gentlemen, yes, it was still just men, who comprised the staff of the first official report team. Then there's a long gap to 1947, when the team had grown to 25, and there were two women in the photograph. Now, one of those women was the editor's wife, who obviously had come up to London for the day because she was wearing a splendid hat and carrying a bouquet of flowers. But the other was a lady called Jean Winder, and Jean was the first female employee of Hansard, having joined in 1944. Then there's another long gap in the photographs to 1972. This time, it shows 35 people, of whom eight are women. So the number of staff has increased steadily over the years as the workload has increased, and the number of women has gone up with it. Now we have about 100 members of staff in total, including those from the Broadcasting and Parliamentary Recording Units, and the balance between men and women is roughly 50-50. In 2005, I became the first woman editor of Hansard in the House of Commons, but not in Parliament. The House of Lords beat us to that by about 20 years, and they've had three women editors to our one. But I'm glad to say that they have now embraced the concept of diversity and inclusion and equality, and their current editor, who's sitting just here, is a man. What other changes have we seen since 1909? Well, for a long time, the method of production stayed pretty much the same, using shorthand to record debates, typewriters to transcribe them, and sending heavily edited bits of paper over to our printers, Her Majesty's Stationery Office, to typeset and print them. But in the early 1970s, the number of committees had increased so much that it became impossible to recruit enough shorthand writers to cover them all. So Hansard had to come up with a new sort of reporter, and that was the transcriber. These ladies, for they were almost all ladies in those days, transcribed the tape recordings of committee meetings, and then the transcripts were edited by committee sub-editors. The House of Commons continued to be reported using shorthand only, until the advent of radio broadcasting in the late 1970s, at which point it became necessary for the Hansard reporters also to have access to backup recordings. But the ability to write very fast, accurate shorthand remained one of the main skills, and it became very difficult to recruit people with that skill. Newspaper journalists, who had been one of the main areas of recruitment, had stopped the practice of taking full verbatim notes, and so their need for speed decreased. It got to the point where Hansard decided that the only way in which it could get the skilled reporters it needed was to set up its own shorthand school. And so we did that. In 1977, we took in our first batch of graduates, put them through a two-year shorthand course. And we ran several such courses over the following 10 to 15 years. Uh, but during that time, we changed from teaching Pittman's shorthand to stenography, the machines that you see sometimes if you watch uh, American 
um, courtroom dramas on TV. But that was still an expensive and time-consuming way to produce reporters. So the decision was taken, and not without a great deal of, uh, of soul-searching, especially among us shorthand writers, that the most important skill of a Hansard reporter wasn't um, how they captured the words, but what they did with them afterwards. So we dropped the requirement for shorthand and devised instead a much shorter training program in tape reporting. It enabled us to turn out really good quality reporters within six to nine months instead of the two years that it took with the shorthand courses and it vastly increased the pool of potential recruits for Hansard. We do still have a few people who use shorthand, mostly the stenograph machine, but nowadays the vast majority of Hansard reporters work from the audio recording. Now, of course, when relying on technology, there is always the risk that it will fail. That ha hasn't happened too often, although there was an occasion about 10 years ago when the sound system in the chamber failed, and the only shorthand writer around at the time was me. Um, so I had to grab a notebook and pen and go down to the chamber, sit at the clerk's table, which was quite nerve-wracking, in front of the speaker and attempt to use my very rusty shorthand to record what was going on. Now, luckily, it was um, the last debate on a Friday afternoon and there was only the member and the minister uh, there, so it was quite a sedate affair and I coped all right, but I shudder to think what would have happened if it had, been, if it had happened during Prime Minister's question time, for example. We had another incident not too long ago when the microphone operator for the chamber was unable to get into his operating booth and we lost all the sound amplification and recording for the first seven minutes of question time. We could have done with the services of old memory woodfall uh, then, I think. But through a combination of reporter's memory, a sub-editor taking a shorthand note, a very faint and scratchy recording made on a personal uh, recorder up in the uh, press gallery, and the help of members reconstructing what they had asked, we produced a pretty full report of proceedings. Full enough that no one complained about it the next day, anyway. What other changes have we seen over the years? Well, one such change was in the size of the printed version. Before 1980, Hansard was published in Royal Octavo. That's about the size of an iPad, for those of you who don't know what Royal Octavo is. But because the ageing printing presses at HMSO had to be replaced, they recommended moving to A4, which was in accordance with modern printing technology. Some members were very unhappy about the prospect of modernisation. And over the course of four debates, yes, four debates in the House, they fought a gallant rearguard action against the smaller size. Sorry, to retain the smaller size, which of, poor, of course was perfect for getting into one's overcoat pocket, as generations of members had been used to doing, or even of getting into one's handbag. The Conservative member for Canterbury at the time came up with what he no doubt thought was the clinching argument. The new size, he said, would be much more difficult to read in bed. <laughs> when it came to the decision, however, those 63 stalwarts were unable to hold back the tide of change, and in January 1981, the new size was introduced. So we produce one of these documents every day. It's called the Daily Part, and we're able to include all proceedings up until the early hours of the morning. Our record is 1.45 a.m., and still have it printed and distributed and delivered to the House by 7.30 the following morning. A further change came in the cover price. Now, the cost of printing Hansard used to be the responsibility of the Treasury, and it was the Prime Minister, as the First Lord of the Treasury, who had to decide our cover price. Shortly after Margaret Thatcher was elected as Prime Minister in 1979, she was told that she had to make that decision. And she asked two questions. How much does it cost and how much profit does it make? Well, she didn't much like the answers. The first was 80 pence and the second was none. In fact, the minister who brought her this news had to own up to the fact that, in fact, Hansard had to be subsidised um, in order, uh, substantially subsidised in order for it to, to be sold at 80 pence. Mrs Thatcher's uh, response was typically robust. She ordered that the subsidy be eliminated by the end of that first parliament and that Hansard should be sold at an economic price. So the cover price rose to £5. 
where it remains today, actually, so it has defied inflation somewhat. But as the price rose, so the number of, number of people and institutions buying copies fell dramatically, from 4,000 in 1979 to close to 1,010 years later, to just a handful today. But of course, it is now freely available on the internet, so it isn't surprising that very few people buy, to, buy the paper version. Sitting times have also changed a lot over the years. When I started, it wasn't unusual for the house to sit until three or four o'clock in the morning, almost every sitting day. Although to be fair, they didn't start until 2.30 in the afternoon, so we had the mornings to sleep in. In Hansard, we don't operate a, a shift system for reporting the house, and the staff have to stay until the very end. So it meant people spending long hours at work, not having a social life at all during the week, and not seeing an awful lot of their families while the house was sitting. Things are better now. We have one guaranteed late night on a Monday um, when the house sits until 10.30 or 11 p.m. and then slightly earlier finishes on Tuesday and Wednesday and then Thursdays usually finish at 5.30. But please don't picture us putting on our coats and leaving the building the minute the house rises. The Hansard staff are still here, finishing up the reports a good hour or hour and a half after the house rises. So the problems of not having a social life or not seeing one's family haven't entirely gone away. Now obviously one of the things that we've had to think about in Hansard more recently, and in common with many other departments in the House and in Parliament, is how much of our output actually needs to be printed now that it's so easily accessible on the internet. Last year, we stopped printing the weekly version of Hansard, which basically was the daily parts gathered together, but not corrected. The final version, and authoritative version, which is called the bound volume, does include corrections that we've received to any mistakes we might have made, and corrections that we decide to make ourselves after proofreading all of the daily parts. We used to provide all members of Parliament with free copies of the bound volume, but we stopped doing that earlier this year. They can still purchase them if they want, but not many have taken up the option. Um, and now we print only enough copies for the libraries and the other procedural offices here in Parliament and for the deposit libraries around the country. Next summer, we'll stop printing the government's answers to questions that have been tabled by members, and those answers will be available only online. So if we were having this talk this time next year, the copy of Hansard that I'm holding up would be a good deal thinner because at least a third of it would have gone. The shift from print to digital means that we have to be right at the top of our game when it comes to web presentation and searchability. And we'll be focusing on improving both of those over the next couple of years. We already publish Hansard reports on the day itself. We call it Rolling Hansard and on the website it's called Today in the Commons and there's a similar page for the House of Lords called Today in the Lords. Our target is to have a member's speech online within three hours of their having finished speaking, which is a pretty quick turnaround. We do pro high profile events such as Prime Minister's question time even quicker. And I think our record there is producing that within one hour and 20 minutes of the end of Prime Minister's questions. Rolling Hansard uh, has been a real success story for us. And the latest web statistics show that uh, we had 23,000 external hits on it last month which is a 15% increase on the year before. Another area where we intend to up our game is in the relationship between words and pictures. We want to introduce links from the Hansard text to the video of the moment, so that people can see how a member or minister has spoken, as well as what they said. As Stephen alluded to, we're not allowed to use stage directions or to give clues to the reader in Hansard beyond the judicious use of punctuation and the very occasional exclamation mark. So it is difficult to get across on the page emotions such as anger, elation, frustration or sadness or to render sarcasm or irony, all of which are quite heavily used by members of Parliament. And I think it would be really beneficial for the public to be able to move easily from the text to the pictures to see the context in which something has been said. It will also help to increase the transparency and accessibility of members' speeches,
questions and answers. And it will be of enormous benefit when it comes to searching video. At the moment, we have thousands upon thousands of hours of uh, proceedings on tape and on webcasts, with very few means of being able to search them meaningfully. And next year, we're going to go to a fully online video system for Parliament. And our intention is to attach the data that's generated by, by Hansard to that video so that it can be indexed and searched as easily as the text version is at present. Ideally, we'll be able to do that in real time as well, so that if you're watching the webcast of a select committee meeting, as many people are increasingly doing as select committees become ever more important, you'll be able to see information about the members who are asking the questions and about the witnesses who are answering them. What else is in our future? Well, I hope you won't think me too old-fashioned if I say more of the same. Our reporters and editors produce a first-class document whose name is a byword for accuracy, integrity and standards of English. And we will never change that. We are rightly proud of our reputation and we don't want to do anything that would jeopardise it. Could production methods change again? Well, possibly although I have yet to come across any technology that could replace what we do now. I hear a lot of talk about voice or speech recognition being the future. Now, it's true that its accuracy has improved steadily over the years, especially for individual users speaking to their computers or other devices. And we all increasingly experience its use in automated telephone systems. Indeed, some of the reporters in the Commons, and especially in the House of Lords, use it instead of typing. But it's quite another task to get uh, voice recognition to recognise 650 different voices. We have 650 members in the Commons, some with strong accents, some of them sometimes mumbling a bit, sometimes shouting to make themselves heard above the din, um, sometimes all speaking at the same time. And I've heard claims that it can attain 85% accuracy in such circumstances. Well, all I would say to that is that if you have to produce 200,000 words a day, as Hansard quite often does, then that leaves 30,000 words that are still wrong, and it leaves the other 170,000 completely verbatim, unmoderated utterances that would still have to be moulded into sentences and paragraphs that make sense to the reader. So would it save time and money? In my opinion, no. But we will, of course, keep an eye on the technology, just in case it makes an incredible leap forward in accuracy. And then it will be worth considering using as an alternative to typing. Although, in my view, it will never remove the need for the talent and judgment of the skilled Hansard reporter and editor. And if anyone would like an example of where technology can go horribly wrong, I would direct you to the video of Margaret Thatcher's last appearance at the dispatch box, which appears on YouTube with captions generated by automated voice recognition. Now, it is quite hilarious. But I find that it detracts from what she was actually saying during what was a really uh, wonderful parliamentary performance. And that's not something I would ever want Hansard associated with. We are there to enhance, not to detract. Let me finish with a quote from Matthew Paris, the columnist for The Times, who was once a member of Parliament himself. When he was the sketch writer from The Times, sitting in the press gallery, he was able to observe the Hansard reporters at work and then the next day compare it with what he had heard coming up from the floor of the house. On one occasion he wrote, As we know, in the skilled hands of the parliamentary Hansard note-takers, Monday's gibberish becomes Tuesday's classic English. The room in which the official report is compiled is the nation's top operating theatre for cosmetic surgeons in English prose. As a result, many MPs actually believe they talk sense. Today they strut their hour on the Commons stage talking unintelligible rubbish. Tomorrow they read the report. From the report emerges a speech of passion and clarity delivered in perfect English. Gosh, they murmur over breakfast, did I really say that? They didn't. They didn't say anything like that. Now I don't necessarily agree with Mr. Paris's observation that members speak unintelligible rubbish. Many members are fluent speakers and they are a joy to report. All that I would say is that their, their words are precious to us and we are going to carry on reporting them faithfully and accurately 
so that you, the public, can read exactly what is being said by the people for whom you voted. Hansard is the ultimate no-spin zone when it comes to reporting on parliamentary events, and long may it remain thus. Thank you for listening. <laughs>